Thank you. So we're going to move from one talk where we were talking about tackling some of humanity's greatest challenges to having a conversation about another approach uh, to, attacking, uh, to attacking some of humanity's greatest challenges. So just a very quick question before we start. H how many people here are familiar with Google X, the moonshot factory? OK, so yeah, people pretty, OK, gentleman here is not quite sure, but there, there were some of you who were, who were pretty familiar. So Astro, maybe you can kick us off just by really giving a sense to everyone. You know, it's described as the moonshot factory, which is a great great way of describing anything. Can you talk a little bit about what Google X is and how you define a moonshot, and maybe a little bit about your process? All right, that's, that'll get us the first two hours in, and then we can see where we go from there. <laughs> uh, so Alphabet, 15 years ago, before it was even called Alphabet, but it already had aspirations, uh, set up uh, an innovation engine, which at the time was called Google X. We now call ourselves X, but we have consistently been the moonshot factory. And the vision at the time and still today was go find problems outside of Google's core business areas, and then hopefully find solutions to those problems. So we call ourselves a moonshot factory to try to hold two things in tension. We want to hold the audacity really high for the level at which we can try to tackle some of humanity's biggest problems, creating hopefully enduring businesses that address those problems in the long run. Yeah. Of course, it's not gonna work most of the time, and the truth is, it's really easy to take moonshots if you don't care about efficiency. You just take a huge amount of money and you give it to some really smart, high energy people and you will get a few cool things. But you will be sorry about how you spent your money. It won't be efficient. So the reason we call it a factory is because we're constantly trying to systematize the process of taking these moonshots to get the audacity to try, the humility to know that we're mostly going to be wrong in the early stages, and systematize the process by which we winnow down from a huge number of prospective moonshots to a very small number that are really working as efficiently as possible. And how is that process? Sorry, did you want to? Well, I was going to describe a moonshot very briefly, at least for us, has three basic pieces to it. One, there has to be a huge problem with the world that you want to solve. If you can't name a huge problem you want to solve, there's a real danger it's going to be a bit of an academic exercise. Two, there has to be some kind of science fiction sounding product or service. However unlikely it is that we could actually make it, we could all agree that if we made it, it would resolve, at least meaningfully help, with that huge problem. And then three, there has to be some kind of breakthrough technology, some reason to believe we have at least a chance of making that science fiction sounding product or service real so we could address that huge problem. Once you have those three things, you have a moonshot story hypothesis to which I would say if you worked at X, high five, great job. Now you're almost certainly wrong. Here's a <laughs> tiny amount of money. Go get a few very early pieces of evidence that demonstrate whether you're right or wrong. Again, you're probably wrong. Yeah. And so if you want to know what our process is, it mostly is about, I'm not giving you this money so you can succeed. Yeah. Because you're trying something which has a 1% chance of succeeding. And so I want to stop the 99% that are wrong as fast as possible. So I want us to be really with each other. I'm giving you this money so you can answer the question, is this a once in a generation opportunity for the world? And if it is, <laughs> great. But since it probably isn't, I want you to be able to come back to me with the same level of pride. I spent the money in a smart way and we're getting what we want because I gotta know we can throw this away and get on to the next idea. So over the 15 years you've been operating, it is 15 years, right? Yep. Um, how has that process changed? Presumably the process is very different because you've learned how to... Yeah, so I was saying before that it's really easy to take moonshots if you don't care about efficiency. It is also really easy to be efficient if you don't care about moonshots. You just get arbitrarily uptight about whatever it is you're doing and eventually you will have squeezed all of the waste out of it, but there will be no magic in the process. Now. If you try to start on the efficiency end and then get some magic into the process, it'll never happen. 
So if you wanna know what's really happened, the arc over 15 years at X, we started with a heavy bias towards the audacity yeah. and have slowly been turning up the rigor dials for the last 15 years, very carefully asking the question at each step along the way, how can we turn up the rigor dials, improve the efficiency without lo losing the creativity, the growth mindset, the audacity, the open-mindedness and curiosity that it takes to actually get to something really unusual. Once and, and do you think there's a phase of innovation that you're particularly strong at? Or are you know, you're trying to think all the way through the value chain? Yeah, I think we're, we're the best at the earliest part of the process. And I don't mean science, so we don't do basic science at X. Okay. We are trying very roughly to fill a gap that exists between basic science and the venture capital community, okay. essentially. Just to clarify for the audience, you take external capital as well as using Alphabet's capital. We, the early work we do is entirely paid for by Alphabet. Once we have moved something from that's crazy, that's never gonna work, to wow, that might really be a thing, then sometimes Alphabet will be the investor going forward, but increasingly we are finding we are systematizing the process of putting it outside right. of Alphabet okay. in a way where Alphabet still has significant economic stake in it, but it can go sort of off to the races with market-based capital. Can I give a few examples for the audience of things that have come from X so they have a sense Please. of what this is like? So many of you would know about Google Brain. This is one of the things that helped kick off the sort of modern explosion of machine learning and foundation models. Uh, Waymo, the self-driving cars, that also came from X. Uh, Wing, the drones for package delivery. Uh, many of you may start be starting to see them fly in the UK sure. now. Um, Intrinsic was our moonshot for the industrial grid. Many of you, especially here in Europe, may know about. I'm happy to talk about more, but those are a few examples that, that people may be aware of that have gone through this process. Flip side of that is you guys are also appear to be quite ruthless on killing projects if you need to. What, what criteria do you base that on? How do you think about that? Because presumably, you could just keep at some of these things. Of course. Right. If the standard was, could this work? Almost everything we're working on could work. It doesn't usually break a law of physics. That's not the problem. So if you worked at X, I would say on your very first day, we are obsessed with the reward risk ratio right. of what you're working on. And I'm giving you money not to succeed. I'm giving you money to shrink the variance, to improve our understanding of the reward risk ratio of the thing that you're working on. Okay. And at every moment, we should be wondering, is this pulling our average, the thing you're working on, the teleportation system or whatever it is, yeah. is that pulling our average up or down. If it's pulling our average down after a little while, we should say it is rational for us to stop doing this, not because it couldn't work, but because we're trying to maximize the reward risk ratio of the overall system of the moonshot factory, not of your specific thing. And you need to be on that mission with us from the day you join X because that's what we're optimizing. Yeah. And so it's not like I don't want the teleporter to win but I expect you to turn off your own teleporter project if that's the right way to maximize the overall ward. And it doesn't mean what is the least risky thing. If we find something that has four times the reward and double the risk of the thing you're working on, and we, let's say we had enough information to know for a fact that that was right, then this is twice as good a lottery ticket as the thing that you're doing. And so it is rational for us to stop your thing and do this thing that has half the chance of working because it has four times the upside. Just to be clear, my teleporter is very close to working. Great. Uh, um, how do you, you balance, like, the, 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 I guess on one hand, you have to be quite boosterish about a lot of this stuff. You have to be visionary, you have to be very excited. But there's also the other side of you, presumably, that is someone who's running, I don't know if it's a commercial enterprise, but certainly it's an enterprise that needs to have results of some kind. How, how do you think about that? And I'm asking this as a kind of like a, a managerial question almost, as a, as a personal question. Well, one of the ways of thinking about what we're doing, especially in the very early stages, is we're trying to practice the non-stupid suspension of disbelief. 
<laughs> the suspension of disbelief part, that's the audacity. The non-stupid part is the humility part. Where, so if you want to go on some crazy adventure at X, I'm open. I mean, the crazier the better. And tell me about the non-stupid part. What is the reason to believe that this is at least a testable hypothesis and that we can test it for tens of thousands of dollars in the very early days? Because if like step one is millions of dollars, there's not going to be a step two because mm. I can find something else that has the same reward risk ratio and we can find out something about it for tens of thousands of dollars instead of millions of dollars. So... That's the viciousness is not about you or about your idea. It's we should be beating up on all of these ideas, finding out how cheaply we can get evidence. And so I don't see myself as either a visionary or as a manager, just since you use those two words. Okay. I see myself as a coach on trying to help everyone practice these habits. They're very easy to describe. When I say them, you're like, okay, that sounds reasonable but they are ferociously hard to actually do in an organization. So 100% of my job is holding the line. The things I've just said, we actually practice them. It's freaking exhausting, we don't do it perfectly, but we do it enough better than random that's my job, is every time you sort of stray off and you're like, oh, but I really love my teleporter. I'm like, nope, that's not the plan. Remember, that's not the plan. And I'm so proud. We just had a project like a week or two ago. We had worked on for several years. It's really important to us. I'm super bummed it's over. They came to us with a 215 slide deck. We spent two and a half hours on it. And on the first page, it said we should close down this project. <laughs> I'm so freaking proud of them because that's X working as intended. Okay, so if you're closing down projects, I've, I've heard this phrase, moonshot compost. Presumably that means something that is derived from a failure but then helps to nurture something else. Have you got an example of that you could maybe share with For sure. The audience? So we, when you close down your project, good news, you may stay at X, your team may well stay at X, not necessarily together. The patents will stay at X, the code will stay at X, the learnings can stay at X, some of the partners we may still keep. So we're just stopping this thing the way we're currently doing it. We haven't even given up necessarily on solving that problem, just solving that problem in that way. Right. One of my favorite examples is we did this thing called Loon. How many people know about the stratospheric balloons we did? We felt so good about that, so proud of that team. They solved every technical and operational task we put in front of them. Ultimately, they were turning it into a business, but it just, it wasn't like this. It was like this. It wasn't good enough. So we ended up stopping that as a business. But the way those balloons were talking to each other, between balloons and down from the balloons to the ground, they were talking to the handsets, LTE and 5G but the much higher bandwidth pipes they were using were lasers. And so someone on that team, as this project was winding down, said, you know, supposedly you can't just do lasers on the ground through the air, free space optics. That's why we have fiber optic cables. You use labors, but you have it go through something that protects it from the atmosphere because there's too much wiggle in the atmosphere. And this person said, I know that that's supposedly like the right answer, but give me a shot. I think maybe we could do fiber optic cables on the ground without the fiber optic cables. And seven years later, we now have something about this big. You strap it to a pole, you plug the internet in, it shoots a laser up to 20 kilometers, eye safe. You have to have another box that can see it, but you can put it up in an hour for tens of thousands of dollars and you get 20 gigabits per second fiber optic speed, it would take you years and millions of dollars to trench that fiber. And we're now putting them out in the world, a pair of these, like at least once a day. And it's just so profoundly exciting to see that this thing that came from this project we closed down, they're now moving 50 times more data per day, per day, to customers in 15 countries and expanding quickly than Loon moved in its entire history. So that's Moonshot Compost. Okay, so this is, I have to say, a great dose of optimism. 
Um, uh, the next question I'm asking for a friend, but Europe is not going through a great time at the moment. I think Europe's talking itself down quite considerably. We're always, you know, concerned about the fact that we can't build these trillion dollar companies that you can, you can build in the US. Give us a sense of how we can learn a little bit of something from Google X about resilience, but also about keeping that kind of perspective on we're headed for a certain goal that we believe in and that we think is, is the one we should be pursuing. Um, I'm going to make it a thought exercise because it's the fastest, cleanest way I know how to land this message. So we're all going to play a game. Choice A, choice B. Choice A, you can give a million dollars of value to your business this year guaranteed. Choice B, you can give a billion dollars of value to your business this year, but it's not guaranteed. It's one chance in a hundred. A million B billion, guaranteed, one chance in 100. Who's choosing choice A? Who's choosing choice B? Uh, All right, A. so choice B has 10 times the expected utility of choice A, which is why presumably many of you raised your hand. Now ask the, so if that is rational. You make more money. Except 99 times out of 100, you try it. It was the smart thing to do. You just make 10 times as much money or goodness for the world or whatever it is. But 99 times out of 100, you get a zero. And then you're going to get fired. So you can get 10 times as much if you're in a context that will support you choosing the risky but much higher expected utility choices. And I've done this all over the world they come for a lecture from me on innovation, and I end it by saying, you don't need a lecture on innovation. You need a new manager. And that's what I would say is, it's, it's not actually complicated. You all who raised your hand, you know what the right answer is, and most of you who raised your hand for A, you actually know that B has 10 times the expected utility. You just didn't raise your hand because you're not in a context that supports you taking that risk. If you want the upside, you have to have the mess. There is no way to have the upside without the mess, so you pick a lane. If you can't take the mess, you don't get the upside. So what I would say for anyone who wants to play that game is like, go play it, but be really clear, you cannot play it if you're in a context that doesn't support you playing that game. And I feel deeply grateful X has been around for 15 years and succeeding as a moonshot factory because Alphabet understands that math that I just said, and they support us doing choice Bs over and over again. And I, and I wish the same for Europe. We will be pursuing choice B moving forward. Thank you for such a do dose of optimism. It was great hearing from you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Ashley.